brain. If you have your Bibles, go to Luke chapter 14 this evening. Luke chapter 14. Bryce promised me the best steak dinner in, uh, in this whole area if I preach short tonight. So he must be feeling tired or something. And uh, I told him he, I, I wouldn't sell out for a steak dinner, amen. I'm, so I'm just going to go ahead and preach a couple hours tonight. I'm not selling out for anybody. No, actually, that steak dinner sounded pretty good. But uh, anyways, Luke chapter 14. It's really good to be with you. Uh, thank you so much for your support of CMI, Christian Media International. Um, I was just down with one of your missionaries that you support, Sam, Sam Robles. Uh, and I know he's got family here in the church. I was in Guadalajara uh, a couple weeks ago with Sammy, and uh, man, what a fantastic young missionary he is. He is doing a fantastic job. Uh, your support is going a long way there. He is doing wonderful things, building a phenomenal ministry. Uh, Christian Media International, we're getting behind him to build a studio there and uh, begin broadcasting as soon as we possibly can in Guadalajara and, and spreading out over Mexico. Uh, but it's always exciting seeing these young guys that are just tearing it up, doing fantastic things. Uh, it does my heart well. I came back fired up to see uh, somebody that was doing as much as he's doing in just a few short years. Uh, so keep him in your prayers, and uh, he is doing a fantastic job. Um, Luke chapter 14, uh, this is an interesting passage of Scripture. Jesus uh, always just cuts right to the heart of the matter, and that's what I love. I love when... Uh, Jesus begins to speak, and he speaks to people in a way uh, that just cuts right through. And, you know, I get criticized in my own businesses sometimes for just being too direct. Is anybody like that, where you just, I'm not an emotional guy, right? So I don't, I don't really care how everybody feels or what, how their day is going. I just got to transfer information. So I just say things, and my wife, when I text her, she says, can you use, like, emojis so I know you're not mad at me? Does everybody know what emojis are? And I don't have time for emojis. I, you know, like, so every once in a while I'll give like that little smiley face just so she knows we're good. But it's always, I, I communicate. It's, it's a transfer of information. Jesus does all in the same sentence uh, that we, we aspire to do. And he cuts to the very heart of the matter while delivering information while also getting to the very soul of mankind. And in Luke chapter 14... I want you to take notice of the English language tonight, okay? So uh, this is written uh, in, in King's English, right? So we're reading a King James Bible, 1611, and, uh, and this Bible uh, is very specific. Our Bible is very specific in the use of words, and I want to make sure that we, we look at these words tonight. And so I don't know if you circle words in your Bible or not. If you do, I want you to circle a few. If you don't, I want you to take notice of a few, okay? So uh, it says in verse number 23, Luke chapter 14, verse 23, it says, And the Lord said unto the servant, uh, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. You've heard that ver verse many a times, uh, especially when we're going out and we're uh, knocking on doors and we're inviting people and we're in the bus ministry. Um, and then it goes on to say, And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, actually, I skipped verse 24, For I say unto you that none of those men which were uh, bidden shall taste of my supper. If you circle words, I want you to circle the word for there. Verse 24, the first word says for. Verse 25, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. Now listen to this. Any time that uh, I get criticized for being too direct, I want you to listen to Jesus here, okay? Because it doesn't get any more direct than this. He says, if any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, cannot be my disciple. It's like, whoo, man, talk about setting the bar high right here, right? Like, look, if you don't hate your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, and your own life also, you're not fit to be a disciple. Like, wow, like, that's, that's a very specific, pungent statement. Then, circle the word and, verse number 27, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The next one, I want you to circle the word for, for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all behold it began to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Verse 31, circle the word or, what king or what king going to make war against another king sitteth down not first and consulteth whether he be able to uh, with 10,000 to meet him with, that cometh against him with 20,000 
or else, while uh, the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an, an ambassage and desireth the uh, conditions of peace. And then verse 33, if, you circle, if you're circling words, circle the word so. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. As I jump into this passage of scripture and we dive in a little bit deeper tonight, um, I want you to take note of the English language here. Because it's building a synopsis. It's like David Gibbs in a courtroom, okay? It's, it's building and it's building and it's building and it's coming to a conclusion, all right? So the first thing I want you to see is Jesus is talking about making disciples, the importance of making disciples. And he's speaking about that, and in verse number 24, it uses the word for. Now, anytime that you see the word for, it's referring to something previous that happened earlier in what was said or spoken, right? So it's saying, I'm giving you an example, for, right? So it's saying, so what is that tied to? So it says, and the Lord said uh, unto the servant, go out on the highways and hedges and compel them to come in and uh, in that my house may be filled. For, right? So he's referring to something previous. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Who's he talking about here? Who is the for, a for, a for a part mentioning, right? He's talking about these, uh, these people that are being compelled or the ones that are compelling. In verse 25, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come unto me, right? And you have this passage where Jesus is saying, Look, if any man comes to me, and he hates not his mother, his father, his brother, his sister, and his own life also, he's not fit to be my disciple. That's a really powerful statement. I've heard people explain this away. And I've heard them say, look, it's going to seem that you're so dogmatic or you're so passionate about the Christian life that it might look like you hate others. And I don't necessarily think that that's what he's saying here. I think what is being said here, if you just look at the English language, is that he says, if any man hate not. What does it mean to hate? The very root of this word in the Greek language is to reject right? If you hate God, that means if you reject God, if you turn from God, right? And what he's talking about here in context is to Jew Jewish people in Jerusalem. And he's saying to them, if any of you won't reject, right, you won't turn away. What's he talking about here? He's talking about man-made religion. He's talking about man-made philosophies man-made ideals, and man-made customs, right? Here the Jewish people are just ritualistically going through the motions, doing what they've done for thousands of years, and he's saying, if any of you don't turn, don't reject, don't, don't, don't essentially like go the opposite way of what's being presented to you by this group that's surrounding you, that's giving you these rituals of, of um, of religiosity, he said, then you're not fit to be my disciple. What he's saying here is, is if you don't reject that, then you're disqualifying yourself from following me. It's a really interesting passage of scripture because then he says, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Then he gives a prerequisite to being a disciple. He says, look, if, if, it's, it's, he said, you are going to turn away from all those who are different than what I'm expressing to you. Well, what is he expressing to us? He says, and, right, it's the continuation of the statement before. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And let me just kind of build this with you, and then I'll come back and put a conclusion on it. Then verse 28, I said to circle the word for, so again, he's pointing back to something previous, right? This isn't, when you read this passage of scripture, I think oftentimes people say, oh, these are individual statements or parables that he's speaking about, individual principles. All of them are tied together, and we're missing the context of the whole when they get tied together. For, verse 28, for which of you? He's speaking about the disciples, he's speaking about the prerequisites of being a disciple, for which one of you intending to build a tower? So here's where most people, they go, okay, uh, and, and maybe you've heard this during a building project, 
uh, this, this idea of counting the cost, right? Like we should count the cost. We should know what it's going to take to finish the job long before we ever start it. And sure, that's the principle he's talking about. But the word for here is tying it back to a previous statement. What he's doing is he's giving us an example of what it means to actually carry our cross, to bear that cross. He says, for which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether you have sufficient to finish it. He says, let me give you an example. He said, if you're going to build a tower, he said, who of you wouldn't count the cost ahead of time to make sure you have sufficient to finish it? Let me ask you this. Have you ever seen anybody in the Christian life burn out? Have you ever seen anybody that starts and doesn't finish? Have you ever seen anybody that starts really excited? They, they make lots of passionate commitments. This is what I'm going to do for God. This is what I'm going to accomplish to only fail later, to only bail out, to only give up, right? That's what he's speaking about here. He's, he's likening discipleship and the Christian life to building a tower. Yes, it's the principle of counting the cost, but this principle, because of that word for, is tying it back to the previous statement. What he's saying is, is just like if you want to be a disciple and, and you want to, uh, uh, to bear your cross and, and, uh, and, and come after me, he says, first of all, you better make sure you count the cost. You better make sure that you understand what you're getting into. You know, I, I, I reference oftentimes a lot of the missionaries that we work with because they live this exact uh, principle perfectly. We built a safe house in the country of Turkey. We say, why would you build a safe house in the country of Turkey? This safe house doubles as a church. This safe house is where the people that trust Christ in the country of Iran, they go if they're either persecuted or they have no connectivity to a, to a local church. You see, when people trust Christ in Iran, they're immediately shunned from their family, rejected. As a matter of fact, we were talking to, um, I was talking to our, our missionary there, and he was telling me of a story just recently of a man that uh, trusted Christ off of a television show in Iran. He said he went home, he said he told his parents, this man was about uh, uh, close to 30 years old, not married, and um, he said his parents said, get out of our house, you know what this means, you're no longer invited, allowed, and, and as a matter of fact, you know, you're, you're no, you're, we don't even want you to use our name, you're, you're, you know, you're banned, you're cast out. He said he walked out with two t-shirts on, he put a second t-shirt on, he had one pair of pants, and he had a pair of rubber boots. That's the only thing he had to his name. He had no money, had no food, he had no clothes. This man... Uh, reached out to us, and we actually got him to Turkey to our safe house. He got baptized. We've been helping him. He's actually staying there at the safe house for a period of time. And this man's testimony is phenomenal because he knew the moment that he trusted Christ, it wasn't just the act of trusting Christ. He had already counted the cost. He knew that he would be pushed out of his family. And that happens so often. We have families that go stay in this safe house. As a matter of fact, it's the craziest thing. So our pastor actually lives in Wisconsin. He's an Iran he's an Iranian man who speaks Farsi, uh, who got trained in, uh, he got trained in, in uh, Australia, came to the United States. Dave actually picked him up the first time he had ever touched down in the United States. And Dave was driving him through the city of Atlanta to our studio the first time he'd ever been here. And uh, Dave said that he was so somber, and the reason he was somber was because even the pastor knew his family back in Iran that he was about to preach the gospel on TV was going to be put in harm's way. But he made a choice, and he's told us over and over again, even though his family, oftentimes his family in, in Iran, uh, are terrified of him being the guy that's on TV preaching the gospel all country, because they know that if he ever comes back, he'll certainly be killed. But not only that, they've been persecuting his family because his, they think if they persecute his family, they'll, he'll stop. He's already counted the cost. 
And you want to look at a Christian in the eye that's sitting there and willing to die for his faith. I can't tell you how many times I've heard Pastor Amir that you have met. Pastor Amir says all the time, if they're willing to kill me for their faith, I'm willing to die for mine. That's what he's talking about here. True discipleship. Counting the cost. You know, we so casually get into the Christian life never considering what God is actually calling us to. When Jesus says he wants you to bear your cross, he wants you to take it up, he uses words like, I want you to die daily. I want you, he, he talks about the persecution that's going to come to you. I have to ask you today, when's the last time you've actually felt persecuted as a Christian? When's the last time you actually were going through some massive, massive hardship that was difficult to bear because of the Christian life? Very few people in our culture actually go through that. He says you got to count the cost. Verse 31, he says, or, that means it's a second example that's tied to the first, right? He's giving you the option to either tie to the person counting the cost. He says, or, let me show you another one. He says, or what king going to make war against another king sitteth down not first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him with, uh, that cometh against him with 20,000? He says, which king going out doesn't look at the battle that he's going to face, committing and knowing that his resources are going to go against another. You think about the Christian life. How many of you, as, as you, as you trusted Christ, you said, you know what? Let me count the cost as to what Jesus is going to ask me to do. And you committed not only uh, to a relationship with him to be restored to the Father through trusting Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, but you also that day committed your entire life, your entire being, your entire resources, everything. That's what he's talking about here. Or, he says, which of you said, you know what, I know that I'm going to face Satan himself, I'm going to face uh, the imps of hell who are going to fight me daily, who are going to come against me. And you counted that cost and made the choice to follow him. The interesting part of this passage is that he gives us a conclusion that I think wraps up the entire thing. So I hope you're following me because I want to show you the conclusion. In verse 33 it says, so. So is an English word that means to wrap up or to summarize all that has been previously said so that we understand it together. So, likewise, whosoever. Is that excluding anybody? Whosoever means all. Whosoever means every person who has trusted Christ. Whosoever means every person sitting in this room. Whosoever means Eddie Wilson. Whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh. This word forsaketh is the Greek word uh, apost apostaseeth, and what it means is, is to, to literally come with an open hand. He says, Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor fit for the dunghill, but, but men cast it out. He that hath ear to hear, let him hear. Let me show you the summary here. He says here, so, he says, whosoever, every Christian. That points back to this place where they're rejecting everything that they previously knew. They understood that life and, and, and what God was calling them to do is going to be a sacrifice. And they decided that they weren't getting into this because it was going to be some passive, easy ride. It was going to be battle. It was going to be war. That commits, even though he knows or she knows what it's going to take, decides to move forward anyways. Can be... His disciple. Here's the inter interesting passage is that it all hinges back to the original phrase, and it says, And the Lord saith unto the servant, Go out on the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house 
may be filled. He's talking about the masses. Get the masses in. But can I tell you today why Christianity and why there are certain areas of this world that are still unreached with the gospel? Can I tell you the, the sum of that answer, the sum of that equation? The reason that we have not reached the world with the gospel yet is not because we're not reaching the masses. It's because we're not making disciples. The reason that he goes into, look, you can fill a house full of people. You can fill the church on Sunday. But if there isn't a select group of people that says, you know what? I'm willing to reject everything that I previously believed. I'm willing to follow Christ with complete open-mindedness, searching what he has for me, understanding that it's going to cost me not something, but everything. 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 How do I know that? Because when he talks about the word forsaketh later in the passage, that means to hold on to nothing. That means nothing we possess today is actually ours. It's something that's been given to us by God and entrusted to us as a resource. Why? For the kingdom. Disciples understand that the things they possess are not theirs. They're God's. Knowing that I'm going to have to sacrifice and I'm going to have to fight. Do you know that it's a fight? Do you know that the Christian life is a difficult one? Do you know that you have to work hard at keeping your mind right, having a good marriage, raising good kids? Do you know that that's a fight? I have, I have teenagers now. I know that's a fight. Right? I, I have a son that just graduated college, and I thought once they turn 16, things are going to be smooth sailing. Can I tell you, it must not ever stop, amen? I, I don't, somebody needs to give me some help because maybe, you know, maybe after he, he's 22 or 23, just somebody tell me there's light at the end of this tunnel. 24, that's the special age. All right. And so, you know, I have a 16-year-old, right? And, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's just, it's interesting, right? It's a fight. It's not easy. I thought, I've got boys, right? This is going to be easy. You can tell them what you think about, about them. Like, we don't hold back. I don't want any sissies, right? So, like, we just tell them. We just talk to them like men, right? And uh, it's hard. Having a good marriage is hard. Having a good family is hard. Having a walk with the Lord is hard. Giving to God over holding something for self is hard. Staying focused and making sure that the mission is always in front of us and not the mission of gathering things to ourselves or, or building a kingdom on this earth, but actually laying up treasures in heaven. That's hard. It's hard. Everything else, the, our, our minds, our, the media, everything bombards us with, oh, we need this and oh, you need that. and You got to have this, right? They present to us what type of person we should be and what type of things we should buy and we are in a, in a constant environment of, of stimulation that pulls our hearts and our minds away from Jesus. And he says it's going to be a fight. But the end of this is that salt, he talks about salt here. This is the, the salt, yes, a Christian, but a, the salt that's lost its savor. He's talking about salt that is potent, that preserves, right? Again, he's just defining what a disciple is. It's interesting that Jesus would use these words as he's talking to the multitudes. He's not talking to a select group of 12. He's talking to the multitudes here. It's, he, he brought the multitudes together. He's speaking, and he's saying to them crazy things. If you hate not your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your own life also, you're not fit to be my disciple. Don't follow me. Go away. You're like, whoa. But I think as you follow this passage of scripture, you realize that every failure in Christianity is not a lack of resources. It's not a lack of God's moving. It's not a lack of his presence. It's not a lack of his desire. It's a lack of disciples. And I know that that's become a catchphrase of the Christian life. We've got to make disciples. 
But can I tell you something? Until you truly become a disciple, you'll never make a disciple. Can I say that again? Until you become a disciple, you'll never make a disciple. What is a disciple? A disciple is one who is willing to forego and to shun all of the past traditions that are against the word of God. Number two, it's someone who is willing to sacrifice. Not some things, but all things. And number three, it's someone that is willing to fight every day to stay in the will of God, to raise a good family, to be a good husband, to be a good wife, to be dedicated to making sure that you are what God called you to be. Did you check those boxes tonight? Because that's something we need to go through daily. When he talks about picking up our cross, that's what he's saying. And the picking up the cross isn't something we do one time. You don't do it at salvation. You do it every morning. You do it every afternoon. You do it every day that you realize that you've walked away from what God's calling you to do. You pick it back up. 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 That's what the Christian life is. Where are you tonight? Because if this area is going to be reached for the gospel's sake, it's not going to be with 500 people sitting in this auditorium. It's going to be a small fraction of people that are called apart, that are truly disciples. Is that who you are tonight? Because if you're not, that's what God's calling you to. Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you. I thank you for this opportunity to speak. Father, I thank you for this church and for what it stood for for so many years. Thank you for the McCurdy's, and uh, thank you for so many great people here and their heart for missions their heart for the gospel. Thank you for their passion to reach this area. Thank you for all that they do. I pray that you'd bless them, Lord. And I pray that you'd help us all to check our hearts and make sure that we are your true definition of a disciple. And if we're not, I pray that we would recommit and live our lives in a way that are worthy to be called a disciple and to make a massive impact for you. In Jesus' name I pray.